We have now entered the very low-tech part of this morning's program. I don't have a computer. I don't have slides. I don't have PowerPoint. Uh, I'm just going to talk. David has mentioned a couple of times the film out in the rural. For those that have seen it, it'll be clear to you two things at least have stayed the same over these now starting to creep up on 40 years. One is that community health centers have been a core of not just my own work, but the work of thousands of other health professionals and health workers across the United States for all of these almost four decades. And so there's been continuity. And the second thing that has been true, that stayed the same over all of this time, is that the struggle to eliminate disparities, both in health status and in health care, which was a part of the origin of community health centers, has continued and flourished. And your presence here and these meetings and this program uh, are the best and most powerful evidence of that. I want to digress for a second and say a little bit more about the City University of New York Medical School, because it does involve community health centers in a way that many people are not aware of. Many people are not aware of uh, the CUNY Medical School at all. It's at City College in Central Harlem. It's just coming on to its 30th birthday. We had two commitments when we started this medical school. One was for the recruitment of underrepresented minorities to medicine. And the other was to train people for primary care in underserved areas, particularly urban underserved areas. And we realized that if we were really going to expand the pool, we had to do something different to break the, pover the barriers of poverty and poverty of aspiration that affected the student pool that we were after. And so like the Europeans, we admitted students to medical school at the end of high school. And during our, their time with us, they did a bachelor's degree in science in the first two years of medical school. And then they were guaranteed a place for their clinical years in any of eight participating conventional medical schools. And they signed a contract that said they'd do a primary care residency and they'll come back and put in significant time in primary care in an underserved area of New York State. The tuition for college in the first two years of medical school was $2,500 a year, breaking the barrier of income and poverty. And we have now graduated more than 1,200 students over that time. And every one of those students has done field work, special projects, or spent other kinds of time, every one of them, in a community health center in New York City. And we decided uh, not long ago that we needed better to clinicalize those first two years of medical school that they spent with us. And the City University of New York Medical School now has its own clinical campus in which students first learn their physical diagnosis and then have their first introduction to clinical care and primary care. Our clinical campus, I think unlike that of any other medical school in the country, consists of eight community health centers. And their faculty are, their staff and faculty are part of our faculty. So we have been in the business of making a new generation of people to pick up the task that you yourselves are now engaged in. The task of eliminating disparities, your task, was the goal of community health centers from their very start. And my task today, as I understand it, is to tell you a bit about the real origins of community health centers and the movement that involves all of us here, things that, as time has passed, tend to get lost in the midst of history. And so it may surprise some of you that don't know that there are really two major roots of the origins of community health centers in the United States. One of them was, of all places, in apartheid South Africa. 
and the other was in the American Civil Rights Movement. Let me say a little bit about South Africa. In the late 1940s, which was before official apartheid, but the system was totally an apartheid system, a little window of opportunity open, was opened by people who were appalled by the health consequences of apartheid and interested in doing something about it. A physician named Sidney Clark and his colleagues and as a part of the resistance to the health consequences of apartheid in the South African system, it was Sidney and Emily Clark and their colleagues who really invented what we know as the contemporary model of a community health center and invented and defined community-oriented primary care. Their idea was for centers to provide care to defined populations using epidemiologic methods to assess the health status of that population, to prioritize the problems, to plan and carry out interventions, to evaluate the success of those interventions, and above all, to involve the communities themselves in their work. They had a network of community health centers, two of the first and most prominent were in what was then called a Zulu tribal reserve, 500 square miles of a place called Palela in Natal province, one of the most miserable, deprived, poverty-stricken, poor land, illness-afflicted areas and populations, I think, anywhere on that continent. And a second was in a peri-urban African housing project on the edge of the city of Durban called Lamontville. And through an extraordinary chain of good luck, I got to spend five months there as uh, a medical student, a senior medical student on elective in 1957, working at both Palela and Lamontville. I came back from that experience at Western Reserve where I was in medical school. We had to write a thesis. I wrote a thesis about those projects. And at the end of it, there is a paragraph or so that said, hey, what really needs to happen in this country is that a medical school should sponsor a community health center here in Cleveland or elsewhere in the United States where it's needed. And that's the first proposal that I know of for community health centers here. But that was just kind of a dream. I got immersed in my training. I knew that what I was going to do was international health. And so I trained in internal medicine and got a degree in epidemiology and was ready to go overseas. That took until 1964. And then the second route of community health centers of our whole network now appeared. Uh, and that was the civil rights movement. I had been involved one way or another in civil rights since I was a young teenager in 1942 working for Bayard Rustin and A. Philip Randolph on the first proposed March on Washington. 1964, you will remember, was the Freedom Summer, the Voting Rights Summer. It was the year in which James Cheney and Mickey Schwerner and Andy Goodman, three civil rights workers, one black, two white, one from Mississippi, two from New York, were murdered and buried under a dam for their civil rights work in voter registration. And there was a recognition that that summer was going to be dangerous. And spontaneously, from all over the country, health workers formed an organization called the Medical Committee for Human Rights. Doctors, nurses, social workers, psychologists, and others to go to Mississippi and provide a medical presence, medical care, and protection, not only for the Northern College kids who were coming down to do voter registration, but even more for the indigenous civil rights workers in Mississippi, mostly black, who were going to need protection and care. And I ended up that summer as the field coordinator for that effort, and it gave me a long look around at what was happening in Mississippi and in our own South. Some of you may remember the surveys of hunger and disease, particularly in children that took place in the South that summer and during those years of abject poverty, 
of near starvation, of people who ate at best one meal a day, and much of that was likely to be lard, of people who had to collect rainwater and pesticide barrels because they had no other source of protected water, of people living in plantation shacks and freezing in the Mississippi winters in the northern part of the Delta, of people who had no access of any kind to medical care. We saw all of that that summer. And then at the end of the summer, there was a kind of pause and almost despair. What do we do next? And all of the leftover civil rights workers and Head Start workers, there had been a big struggle over Head Start, were meeting in Mississippi. And on a December 11th of 1964, with my partner, Dr. Count Gibson from Tufts, who had been part of the Medical Committee for Human Rights, we were discussing what to do next. And finally, suddenly, I remembered Palela and said what really ought to happen is that a good northern medical school ought to come down here and start a com comprehensive community health center. And everybody said, what's that? And I kind of tried to describe it. And everybody said, well, we got to do that. But it wasn't clear that it could really happen. It happened because there was a new program, the Office of Economic Opportunity, the War on Poverty, committed to community action and community participation, maximal feasible participation of the poor in its programs with something called the Community Action Program. And it had a director of research and development, another pioneer named Sanford Kravitz, Sandy Kravitz, who was in charge of that part of the program. And in January or February of 1965, I went to see him to talk about community health centers and what it was and how it would work and why it was part of a community action program. By that time, I was kind of losing my nerve a little bit and doing that kind of academic sidestep. I had laid out for two hours to Dr. Kravitz the whole idea of a community health center, community involvement, community-oriented primary care, defined populations, and what we really intended to do. But I said, you know, what we really need to do is uh, let me do a year's feasibility study to see if this would really work. And that would cost about $30,000. And this ought to happen to everybody once in a lifetime. Dr. Kravitz said to me, well, you can't have $30,000. And I said, why not? And he said, well, you've got to take 300000 and do it now. Uh, well, I came back about, I didn't know what a health center budget was really going to be, so I went back to Boston and sat down and figured one out. And I came back a couple of weeks later, and I had a budget for $1.2 million. We have all learned to play that game. And everybody started to swallow hard, but it was a budget for two health centers. One, for reasons that I'll explain in a moment, was called Southern Rural. It didn't specify exactly where it was going to be. And the other was at Columbia Point, a peri-urban housing project on the edge of the city of Boston. We had realized that if Tufts Medical School was going to go start a health center somewhere in the south 1,500 miles away, the two sets of people would scream. The people down south who weren't going to like this interruption of the way they had the society organized, and the people, the poor people in Boston, who properly were going to say, what are you doing 1,500 miles away when we're hurting on your doorstep? And so, without fully realizing it, we started to replicate Palela and Lamontville, a 500-square-mile rural area somewhere, and a peri-urban housing project. And a part of this that's always important that we did then was doing our political homework. One of the reasons we picked Columbia Point it was, in a way, an epidemiologic dream, 1,500 serially numbered apartments in a housing project that made it possible to chart and assess what the problems were, and a place that was cut off from all other sources of medical care, and was also in the home district of the then Speaker of the House of Representatives, John McCormick. 
which was another important part of it. Why did we say Southern Rural instead of Mississippi or Georgia or South Carolina, other places we looked at? Because of the way the War on Poverty Law was written. It said that the Office of Economic Opportunity could make grants directly to communities and community organizations that didn't run through state governments or the existing power structure, white power structure in the South. And we knew that that was going to be resisted. And so the law also had a provision that any project could be vetoed by the governor of the state in which it was proposed to be. And Sergeant Shriver, the head of OEO, could override that veto, but he did that at great political cost because OEO's funding had to be renewed by the Congress every year. And so it looked as if we might be constrained, but there was nothing in the law that said you couldn't give a, that you couldn't give a grant to a medical school in Massachusetts to do a project in Mississippi, and that couldn't be vetoed by anybody but the governor of Massachusetts, not the governor of Mississippi. He didn't care. And so we just reinvented carpetbagging <laughs> and started the first two community health centers at Columbia Point in Boston and in Bolivar County, northern Bolivar County in Mississippi. It was a long struggle. It was a struggle. I'm not going to go into all of the details in Mississippi. A struggle with that state's power structure, a struggle with that state's medical society, a struggle with that state's public health departments. But I want to read to you from that first grant proposal, which I brought along, the boldness of our aims. This first health center proposal to OEO said, and let me read some of it, our purpose is to intervene in the cycle of extreme poverty, ill health, unemployment, and illiteracy by providing comprehensive health services based in multidisciplinary community health centers oriented toward maximum participation of each community in meeting its own health needs and in social and economic changes related to health. And we promised to emphasize the formation of community health associations, to stimulate change in family and community knowledge and behavior related to the prevention of disease, the informed use of available health resources, and the improvement of environmental, economic, and educational factors related to health. And we promised also to become involved in the training of local personnel and the conduct of both descriptive and analytic assessments of health and of the effectiveness of interventions. And so much of what you are now doing in such great and impassioned detail was in a much more primitive form foreseen back then. Those of you who have had a chance to see the film, you'll remember that yes, we did health care and primary care. We dug wells because people didn't have clean water. We built sanitary outhouses because there were no sewers. Working with those local populations, we started to repair the miserable plantation shack housing in which people strive to exist. We invented a bus transportation system so that people could not only get to and from the health center, but to where there was the possibility of jobs and work. We helped the community establish 10 satellite centers, community centers, not only for health center work, but for their own community development. We launched a pre-Head Start program for early childhood intervention. And most of all, we focused on two other things, food and education. Very early on, we realized how hungry people were, how malnourished people were. Over and over again, particularly in children, we saw the combined effects of infection and malnutrition. And for a while, realizing that we had to do something about that, in the little church parsonage in which we started clinical care before the health center itself was built, 
we tried to stock some powdered milk and some eggs and some other foods, and it was a very clumsy system. And so we had a better idea. Our target area of 500 square miles had 10 towns, each town serving a rural area. Each town had a white section and a black section. Each black section had a black grocery store. And so we made some arrangements, and our doctors started writing whenever we saw a child with infection and malnutrition and no other resources, we would write literally a prescription for food. Rx, so much milk, so much meat, so much vegetables, so much fruit. And people would take these prescriptions to their local black grocery store and get it filled. We would always write for enough for all of the children in a family because we knew that no mother was going to feed one child and let the others go hungry. Nobody abused the system. The groceries filled the prescriptions. And they sent the bill to the health center, where we paid for it out of our pharmacy budget. And word of this leaked out. <laughs> word of this leaked out. This is one of those apocryphal stories that turns out to really be true. And the state of Mississippi screamed that this was some form of communism. And folks from the Office of Economic Opportunity came down, really sputtering and yelling and screaming and saying, what did we think we were doing, They're giving away food? And we said, we weren't giving it away. It was part of the health center program and part of the pharmacy program. And they said, well, a pharmacy and a health center is for drugs for the treatment of disease. And we said, that's right. And the last time we looked in the book, the specific therapy for malnutrition was food. <laughs> and they went away because there was nothing they could say to something that stupid but that true. <laughs> but we had a better idea. Actually, our brilliant community organizer, John Hatch, thought this one up uh, among many of the other programs that he was responsible for. Palala had had vegetable gardens. We thought maybe we could get people to grow vegetables here to supplement their diets on unused, empty land. And we thought maybe we'd get 100 families, and 1,000 families raised their hands. And John Hatch said, there's a better way to do that. And with grants from foundations, the North Bolivar County Health Council, our community association, which was from the beginning chartered not merely as a health organization, but as a community development organization, spun off the North Bolivar County Farm Cooperative, a 600-acre irrigated triple cropping farm that grew vegetables instead of cotton. It was nutritional sharecropping. People traded their labor on the farm for shares in the vegetables that they grew. And that effort made a profound change in the diets and health of the people we served in North Bolivar County. And the second part of it was education. Not just staff training, but an office of education that we opened at the health center because we recognized that this was a population cut off from most knowledge of scholarships, of resources, of college applications, of what you could do after high school if indeed you got to high school. The median educational level in Bolivar County at that time was fifth grade in miserable, segregated schools. But there were people that had got past that, that needed to be identified, that needed to be put together with the resources for further training. And we found them. And in the first eight years, eight or nine years after we started that program, from Bolivar County, we produced seven physicians five PhDs in clinical sciences. My favorite always are two young women who got doctorates in clinical psychology from Alligator, Mississippi, population 900. Seven physicians, five doctorates in clinical sciences, 25 or 30 registered nurses, an equal number of LPNs, half a dozen social workers, and the 10 first registered sanitarians, black sanitarians in Mississippi history. That effort 
illustrated what you know from your own work in communities, poor communities that are so often described to us only as sinkholes of pathology, that they are full of bright, tough, resilient, eager people who represent an untapped human resource that it is our privilege to help. Sandy Kravitz went on in those first months at OEO after the grants for Columbia Point and the Delta, again as research and development projects to authorize health centers in Denver, at Watts in Los Angeles, at Miles Square in Chicago, at Martin Luther King in the South Bronx, that first wave. And then in the summer of 1966, we got Senator Ted Kennedy to come to Columbia Point, see what a community health center was, and we went back to Washington and wrote a $100 million provision in the renewal of the War on Poverty to establish an Office of Health Affairs and start seeding health centers across the United States. In 1975, George Silver, of what was then the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, estimated that to meet this country's needs, we would really need 800 health centers, he thought. It's taken a long time, but in fact, we've done that and more, and we are gonna be doubling the number that we have now, as you know, uh, over these next few years. Let me read, finally, before closing with two stories, the basic premise uh, that was in that first health center grant from 1965 uh, that seems to me is so resonant with what you're doing in the Disparities Collaborative and your work here over the next few days. What we said then in that first grant so long ago was that conventional approaches to health improvement that deal only with narrow definitions of health and illness are unlikely to make major changes. The need, we said, is not merely for the provision of more preventive and curative health services, but also for the development of new organizational patterns to make the distribution of such services uniquely effective, just what you have been looking at at those PowerPoint slides at the outset this morning. And we said further, the need is not for the distribution of services to passive recipients, but for the active involvement of local populations in ways which will change their knowledge, attitudes, and motivation. The central focus is community-based health improvement. And that's what has been revived and strengthened and really, for the first time, fully realized by the Health Disparities Collaborative and what you're doing. Finally, I was struck by a phrase in one of the brochures that said, not just changing practices, but changing lives. And let me close by telling you the stories of two women and how their lives were changed by community health centers. One of them may be known to some of you, my colleague Elsie Dorsey from Mississippi, uh, the child of sharecroppers who grew up picking cotton as a sharecropping child in Marigold, Mississippi. Dropped out of school in the ninth grade to become an aide to the great Mississippi civil rights leader, Fannie Lou Hamer, in the most dangerous early years of the civil rights movement in Mississippi. Joined our health center staff as a trainer of nurse aides in 1966. And while doing that, did her high school equivalency certificate in a program that we had at the health center, along with a program of college preparatory courses that the health center staff taught at night, became the trainee director and then the director of the Bolivar County, North Bolivar County Farm Co-op and ran it brilliantly and then just skipped college and with her high school GED degree entered 
the Masters of Social Work program. She skipped college and graduate school, went right to graduate school. The Master of Social Work program at Stony Brook. Graduated with honors at the top of her class. Came back to Mississippi, worked as a social worker for the Delta Ministry, Parchman Prison Project, and similar organizations while putting all six of her children through college. Two of the girls have public health degrees. And with that accomplished, went to Washington to Howard University and did a doctorate in social work, working at night at a nursing home in order to support herself, and a certificate in health management at Johns Hopkins. And then she came back to Mississippi and took my old job as the director of the Delta Health Center and ran it for years. Brilliantly did a much better job than I did. That's one life changed by a community health center. Let me tell you about a second. I was part of an organization in the 70s and 80s called CHISA. It's the Zulu word for heart. It was the Committee for Health in Southern Africa, and it was the main support organization for the medical and other resistance to apartheid in South Africa, South Africa's National Medical Dental Association. And most of those folks were in exile from South Africa, but still working for change there. And every couple of years, we would have kind of a two-day workshop in New York and bring African National Congress health professionals in exile to New York for a workshop to talk about what they were doing to raise funds to meet with each other. And we would always have them scatter around the New York City medical schools to give a seminar on what was happening and what needed to happen in South Africa to spread the word and to earn some honorariums which they badly needed. Let me backtrack to what had happened at Palela. When apartheid came full-blown, Palela and all those other health centers were closed down. Dr. Kark and his colleagues had to leave the country, start over again, in, first in North Carolina, then in Israel. And about 10 years later, the great social epidemiolo epidemiologist John Castle who had been a clinical director at Palela, was now a professor of epidemiology at Chapel Hill, went back to Palela to see if there were any visible evidence of change 10 years later that the health center had been there. And unsurprisingly, he didn't find much in the way of health change. But he was struck by the fact that in the area that the health center had served, as compared to other similar areas, there was a much higher degree of educational achievement and of educational aspiration, exactly what we had seen in Mississippi and indeed part of the experience that prompted us to focus so on an educational component of the health center's work. Well, uh, now we're back in New York in the 1980s and a CHISA workshop, and here came someone from that workshop to give a seminar at City College and CUNY Medical School, a distinguished pediatrician with training in tropical medicine and public health on top of it, who was a leader of the South African exile community and the anti-apartheid movement in the United Kingdom, someone who had had to flee medical school in South Africa and finish her training in England. And we were walking across the street to have lunch and idly I said, where were you born? Where did you grow up in South Africa? And she said, Palela. And I said, how old are you? And how old were you in 1957? It turned out that when she was a skinny little nine-year-old girl in 1957, she had been my patient. And she indeed remembered this kind of weird white foreign couple uh, that had been helping to take care of her then. She seemed the perfect person to ask about John Castle's observation. Did she think that the health center had had something to do with her educational achievement and her career and those of others? 
And she thought for a minute, and she said, there was no question. She said, you had to go to the health center. You had to see skilled black nurses. You had to see interdisciplinary and interracial teams to know that there was some kind of a future. And then she paused, and she said, well, I think that was true only for the people in the part of the tribal reserve that were closest to the health center so that they got there with some frequency. And I said, that made sense. She thought a little more and she said, but you know, you not only had to be in the part of the reserve that was close to the health center, you had to be near the highway. And that didn't make any sense. And I said, why is that? And she said, because you had to really understand that there was a road out. And that's what we do, I realized that day. We build a road out together with the people we care for, a road out of illness, a road out of poverty, a road out of hopelessness, the things that illness and debility and disease and the environmental circumstances that so often produce them do. That woman's name, who coined the idea of the road out, is in Kosozana Zuma. She was Nelson Mandela's first minister of health when South Africa was liberated, and she is now South Africa's foreign minister. There is a book called An Unsteady March by Philip Klinkner, a University of Chicago historian that traces the history of civil rights struggles and struggles for democracy and equity in the United States. And the title is to make the point that it hasn't been a smooth and seamless story of progress, as some people would have us believe. It's been an unsteady march with lurches and setbacks and long periods of regression and then bursts of change. But it has always had on that march its steady warriors. And it seems to me for these last 40 years, the steady warriors, among others, have been people in community health centers, have been people committed to equity, have been people committed to ending the disparities in our larger society, the disparities in health status, the inequities that underlie them, and committed to ending the disparities in health care that also afflict our health care system. I guess by now I'm one of the older warriors. You're the new warriors. I salute you for your work, for continuing the efforts that began so long ago, and that I have every confidence are going to march on for decades in the future. Thank you for your time and attention. <laughs>